Thank you. I teach because I love to watch people figure things out. There are two experiences in my life that set the ground for this. The first one was being uh, an assistant with Jean Piaget and his colleague Berbel Inhelder in Geneva, studying children's thinking, what they think and the ways they think and the ways they learn. This was a wonderful experience for me, and um, part of the best of it was interviewing the kids. So I learned um, how hard children will work to make sense of things. I learned how fascinating it is to watch them work. I learned not how not to disturb them. That is, not to influence, just let them talk freely and not influence them, because we were researchers after all, and it, we learned nothing if we influenced what the children were saying. And I learned the importance of establishing conflict so that they had two different ideas in their mind at the same time that led to different conclusions about what was happening and the struggle to figure them out and be consistent with themselves. The second experience was with an elementary school science curriculum project, the elementary science study. I was hired there because I knew something about children's thinking, but in fact I knew absolutely nothing about science. So my colleagues um, had everything they needed to develop this curriculum except kids. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I served as a sample kid for my first six months on this job. And um, this was a brand new experience for me. My colleagues uh, knew that science was of the world. It wasn't words about the world. And so for them, the basis of every curriculum was give the kids the stuff. So I was given stuff that they were working on to make it productive, make it fascinating, make it helpful to explore. And um, they had questions often related to these things, so they set me to work to check out whether this would interest somebody and what somebody would do with it. So it was a very fascinating time for me. Um, I learned about balances and pendulums and growing seeds and the moon and ice cubes and all kinds of stuff <laughs> with my own investigations. Um, and in the case of science in particular, uh, the stuff is the authority. You don't need some other person in between you and the things. So it was me, my ideas, and the things. And it was exhilarating. I, I had never felt my mind work in that way before. It, uh, it was very soon that I was uh, committed to being an educator in order to give teachers and children everywhere that same kind of experience. Um, after a while of being a sample child, um, we, we went into the classrooms and started using the materials with, with children. And my job then was to talk to the children to find out what they were understanding from my colleagues' materials. And um, I found that as I, I was good at doing this, because that was my professional training, talking to the kids and finding out what their thoughts were and not trying to give them my thoughts. And I found that the more I was interested in their thoughts, the more they were interested in their thoughts. And the more they got interested in pursuing this investigation. And uh, I benefited by finding out what they were thinking and I could tell my colleagues what they were thinking, what, what they had concluded and what their questions were. And they uh, kept going deeper into the subject matter. So that was a very important experience for me. And um, it led to what became uh, an approach to teaching. So now my colleagues and I um, approach teaching in this way by listening, because we know that that's what will engage the learners in the subject matter. We've done it with my colleagues in many different subject matters beyond science, um, from Chinese brushwork to medicine. Um, and with the basis being find something interesting for them to think about, interesting and deep and productive and important, find ways to get them interested in it, give them parts of the world that will get them interested in it, and listen to them. And the listening is a, is a huge um, part of it. Um, I found that my training in listening to children's thinking was the essence of this work. Uh, trying to bring out every idea that somebody had and making sure that we all knew what that idea, the import of that idea and where the confusions were and how to pursue it. All ideas had an equal value. And I've even come to call this very recently 
the democratization of ideas. So an idea isn't um, more legitimate than another because it came from a textbook, or more legitimate than another because it uses technical terms, or more legitimate than another because it comes from the dominant culture. Um, every idea deserves its hearing. And we find that when we approach our learners that way, the, um, the ideas that flow, the flow of ideas is very remarkable, and people get committed to every kind of subject matter. So I'd like to show you a couple of examples of um, people getting involved in subject matter. They're both examples of um, young people, though we have found that uh, there's no change in our approach, however, however old the leaners are. So I want to start with an example from poetry and work done by Lisa Schneier, one of my colleagues, a very remarkable woman. Um, they're examples to show you um, the potential of hearing everybody's idea and letting, keeping the teacher's voice out of it, not, being a, not ever being the authority. The subject matter is the authority. So let's look first at this poem. This is a poem that Lisa Schneier did with ninth graders in an inner city school in Boston. So the first thing, I'm just going to give a tiny brief example of the kind of conversation that goes on. The students' first responses were, I don't get this. It don't rhyme. It don't make sense. It's silly. It doesn't make sense. It's stupid. It's exaggerating too much. I mean, it can exaggerate, but it's got to make sense. <laughs> and Lisa said, you said too much exaggeration. What do you mean by too much? James said, it's stupid. I don't know. I just don't like it. So as she got them talking about what made it stupid, they were often talking about the fact that it didn't seem to hold together. There were lots of pieces and other pieces didn't hold together. So she said, can you show me what the different pieces are? And one of them said, like around the end, the starting, the middle, like, <laughs> like everywhere, I don't know. So she said, just show me one piece and then what another piece is that doesn't seem to go with it. So they did that. They worked on this poem for several sessions. And um, in a later session, Marco had an idea. Uh, he said, it doesn't have to be a woman or a man, or it could be the destruction of our forests or something, something torn down, or a farm or something. And uh, the other students thought this was absolute nonsense. And, um, they kept saying, yeah, but he doesn't say a farm. She says potato peels. It doesn't say farm. So, um, but Marco kept with it, um, and all of them kept going back to the poem, but what was in the poem, what wasn't in the poem. That was the only authority they had to go with. Marco said, it doesn't have to be a woman. They, and then, sorry. Um, in the conversation, Mark, Marco shouted, no, at one of the things somebody said. And Lisa said, go ahead, no what? He said, it still doesn't have to be a woman, man. <laughs> so as Lisa puts it, I interpreted Marco's main question as follows. Once language moves beyond the boundaries of direct referring, 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 once it becomes figurative, how do we secure its meaning? If it could mean anything, since it's no longer bound by the rules of ordinary prose, how do we determine what it does mean? Which is about as profound a question as you can get in thinking about the poetic use of language and the figurative use of language. So um, these kids are here quite wonderful, but I also hope you noticed Lisa's role in uh, giving space to any idea that was offered seriously, never de declaring which was the ideas she thought worth following. And it was all up to the kids to see what was in that poem and to make what they could of it. That's the first example. Now the second example is from um, mathematics. 
Um, so this problem is um, the red paper clips are units of milk, and the green paper clips are units of chocolate syrup. It's going to be very syrupy chocolate milk, but that's how it is anyway. Um, I do this because I don't want to cast it in mathematical terms. I just say, here's the milk, this is syrup. And I want you to figure out whether two cups of milk would taste the same or whether one would be more chocolatey than the other. So um, the two, we, we do some practicing, first of all. And when I do this with adults, I don't let anybody use numbers. So when you're watching this, I want you to try to get your mind away from calculations of ratios or percentages or fractions. <laughs> And just use your mind to think, uh, what's more, what's less? Um, how can I figure this out? Because that's what the kids will be doing. The kids, I usually let use numbers, and they went into fractions for a moment, but they dismissed them very quickly. They weren't being helpful. So, <laughs> um, <They rarely> are. <laughs> so um, after some practice of uh, what you could say about uh, one arrangement without using any numbers, uh, these are the two that I settled on. Four milk, three chocolate, three milk and two chocolate. And um, they have various different ways of comparing them. And I want to tell you, I'm not going to be able to stop the film once it goes, so you're going to mostly see affect in the film. But I want to tell you some of the issues they're dealing with. <laughs> they first thought, when they first saw these two, the two on the left, they said, uh, after a little thought, they said they would taste the same, because it's just one more milk in each one. And then, um, then I brought in some others and caused a great dilemma <laughs> because, <laughs> because then um, that one, this one also has just one more. So uh, that should also taste the same. On the other hand, they also saw a reason to say that this one is less, this one is less, I'm going to go here, I think. <laughs> this one is less milky than that one or than that one, let's say, because uh, it's only got half as much chocolate, uh, less chocolatey. It only has half as much chocolate as milk, and this has more than half as much chocolate as milk. So, and then this one also has more than half as much chocolate as milk. Then um, they thought, um, then I had them compare these two, and they saw these were the same. They decided these were the same, partly because you could make, you could do two of those and put them together, and it would make this. So those are the same. And then um, they had two different ways to think about this one, uh, comparing it with this one. They would say, at the same time, they could see this one was less chocolatey than that one, and this one was the same chocolatey as that one. Because they, they would always go back to this. You take off one of each, and you've got the same thing. So they must taste the same. All you did was take off one of each. So <laughs> take off one of each here, they would take them off the opposite. Anyway, take off one of each here, and that's exactly the same as that, so they taste the same. <laughs> so that was a basic, that was their basic approach. And um, then they would say, so they got into huge dilemmas about, well, these three taste the same, and that tastes different. And then I would say that once upon a time they'd said, these taste the same as it. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'd say, um, well, they all taste the same except this one. Um, no, then they say, okay, yeah, so they all taste the same. <laughs> and then I'd point out this one. So here they have, oh, so, oh no, that one's more chocolatey because it has the same amount of milk and more chocolate. <laughs> and then we'd occasionally get back to this one, and this was the same amount of chocolate and less milk. So it's, uh, those are the sorts of things they were debating while, um, when they came to, um, to work. Uh, wha by the time we got to the part I'm going to show you. So they'd been working at it for about 25 minutes by then. And I'm going to show you the last um, two minutes, and then um, I'd like you to turn it off as soon as she says, OK. Which is, okay, so um, I'll turn this off, you can turn that. And so I'm not going to be able to stop it, but I'll, I'll try to indicate which ones they're talking about, but we're not even going to be able to do that very well. But let's see what we find.
I think that these two are the same. These two? Mm -hmm. and okay, I decided. I'm not sure about those. Okay, I think that these two are the same. And... And I'm not sure about these two, maybe. Well, it all depends on how you look at it. Because if you take away that, the same amount of milk and chocolate, it's the same. But, if you do that, well, I guess these two are the same and these two are the same. I guess I'm just These two are the same and those two are the same. Yep. Well, and, they're, and they're different from, and those are different from these. Yeah. Think, what do you think? I think these two are the same because this is half. Mm -hmm. and, then and then this half. is half. Mm -hmm. And then I think these are the same because this one has one more milk and this one has one more milk. So yeah. Then on the other hand, this one also has one more milk. Um, and also... Okay. But they can't all be the same because this one's different. But these two are the same. And also, I think because... Can you I... Only you have to... Can I do like two things that I think? Can I use like one more than once? I what think. Show me what want to well, I think that these three are the same, mm -hmm. and then these two are the same. So I'm using this one twice. So that's this. This is the same as that, and that's the same as that. But and this that's, isn't the same as that. Yeah, and the okay. So I think these three are the same, not this one. I got it. These three are the same. Yeah. And then these two are the same. Yeah. Oh, so you're going back to that. So, but there's nothing the same between this side and that side. No. I don't see how that makes sense, though, because if these three are the same... Shouldn't this be the same? The same then yeah. Then shouldn't, it, then it, shouldn't that be the same, too? It should be, but I'm not sure. We're supposed to f turn it, all of this at 6.30 and everybody goes home, right? Oh, God. 6.30. Okay. Well, you know what I think you should do? I think uh, you should write down how many paper clips there are in each of those and go away and think about it forever after. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so you need paper. My time is up.